Hello, I'm Pastor Joel Silberman. Thank you for watching Regeneration Television Broadcast. It's my hope that through this message you are encouraged and made stronger in Jesus Christ and the truth of His Word. Enjoy this message and may God richly bless you. Resurrection is a time of hope. Amen. It literally is a time of hope. It is the message of the resurrection, which we're going to look into today, is the bedrock of Christianity. Right. It's the bedrock. We would have nothing if Jesus had not risen from the dead. What would we have? A lot of empty promises. Amen? Right. But he fulfilled those promises, and we're going to talk about that, by his being literally raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. The four Gospels each speak of the resurrection of Christ. Now, not every Gospel has every same thing in it. In case if you've read the Gospels, you know some have a little different point of view. And that's the truth. The reality is God used each of those four men to bring God's Word, not their Word, God's Word through their own personalities, through specific things that they saw, things that were important to them. But the resurrection is laid out and spelled out in every single Gospel. And so we need to understand when God says, says something to us four times, you think it's important. Yeah. I would say so. So the Holy Spirit, who's the author of Scripture, is saying, this is important. This is what happened. And we're going to read John's uh, translation of that this morning, because we've been doing the first book, the book of 1 John. So the resurrection is the central fact in our Christianity. On it, the church is built. Our faith is built on it. The church, the body of Christ, is literally built on it, the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is unique because other, reg other religions have strong ideas about paradise and afterlife. We're hearing a lot of that in our news. They have their own book, their own scriptures, but only Christianity has a God who became human left heaven, became human, put on flesh, literally died for all people, and was raised from the dead in power and glory. No other religion can say that they have that truth. One day, he is also going to come back again. Yes. Sometimes we don't hear enough of that in our culture today, even in our church culture. So let's look at our first PowerPoint. We're going to look at the book of John. You're going to just flow through this with me. This is John's version. He is an eyewitness. This is a young man at the time of Christ, a man who was devoted and dedicated to the Lord. And he is now going to tell what he saw and what happened to him. So John 20, verse uh, 1 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he's referring to himself. That's John. He referred to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Next one, so Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead. John ran ahead faster than Peter, and he came to the tomb first, and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen, linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Now, to you and I who have lived after this event, we say, oh, we've heard this. Probably most people living today have heard the this, this story of the gospel. But remember, in this time and in this day, Day, this was not known to them, even though Jesus had been trying to make them ready that these things would occur. How can you wrap your mortal head around someone being raised from the dead? I mean, really, think about it. So look at it. Let's look at our next one. So Simon Peter also came following John and he enters the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head. 
not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, meaning John, who had first come to the tomb, then he also entered, he saw, and he believed. Amen. He saw, and he believed. Belief was not yet part of all of the disciples' mentality, but it was part of John's. He saw, he was remembering the things Jesus had said, and he believed he has been raised from the dead. Amen. For as yet the others did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. Now that's not indifference. This is their mind has been blown. They have watched Jesus been horribly crucified on a cross. His body coming off of that cross, Scripture says, was marred beyond description. They, they saw this. They knew what had happened. This was the news throughout the whole area because of the reputation that Jesus already had formed there. And so they go home to their homes wondering, what is happening probably much fear gripping them. They know there can be great retaliation from the Romans. There can be great retaliation even from the Jewish leaders. And so they go back to their homes. Now let's look at our next one. But Mary was standing outside the tomb. So she had come running back with them. And now she's staying there by herself and she's weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. We had the blessing with uh, Joe and Pastor Lisa of going to Israel two years ago and literally going to this place that is renowned as the tomb of Christ. And you can literally walk into this tomb and you see two places where bodies would be literally laid out on them. So the tomb in this day was very different from what we think of in our cemetery. This tomb was unique out of rock. And this was the evidence really of a rich man's grave because people in that day and age would never have that kind of a tomb, the average person. You had to really have great wealth. So she looks into the tomb and she sees two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. Now remember, Mary was an eyewitness at that cross. She was one of the last people to leave the site of that cross. She has watched Jesus' body come down. She has been part of looking to prepare that body from the cross with the spices and so forth that they would use in that day and age. She knows his body has been laid in this tomb. This man was dead, and now he's missing. And she's saying, what's going on? The angel said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Now, you got to picture this story. I mean, I just love this because what's going on in earth is totally different from what's going on in heaven. These angels are looking at this mortal woman who's devastated, and they're saying, what's the problem? <laughs> she says to them, because they've taken away my Lord. You know, it's almost like you say, what do you mean? What are you asking me? Why am I weeping? They took away my God, this body that was buried here. And I don't know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and she sees Jesus standing there, but she, of course, does not recognize him. How would she recognize him from the condition she last saw him in? And Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? Supposing, to, uh, supposing him, Jesus, to be the gardener, she says to him, and I love this, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Last at the cross, first at the grave. You're talking devotion. You're talking this woman saying, Whatever I have to do, you show me where he is. I'm going to take care of him. And what does Jesus say to her? Mary. Personal Jesus. Mary. Mary. She turns and she says to him in Hebrew, 
Rabboni, which means teacher. There is the intimate relationship described between the living God and every person placed on this earth. That is the relationship that Jesus wants because when Mary is saying who she thinks to this gardener, where is he? And he calls her by name. She recognizes his voice. You know, your voice is like your handwriting. It's like your fingerprint. It's only your voice. My husband and I were laughing. I said I could recognize his voice anywhere in the universe, wherever we are. Even his cough. If I'm far away, I recognize his cough. Because that voice is so dear to me. I know that voice. I know the sound of it. And so she knew the sound of her Savior's voice. And she hears this one that she is sure is died and has been taken, literally kidnapped. My God, this is you, Lord? And she calls him teacher, which is the endearment. And Jesus says to her, stop clinging to me, for I've not yet ascended to the Father. He still had a work that he was doing. He's not being mean to her. He's just saying, not now. Don't cling to me just now. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father yes. and your father. Yes. My God yes. and your God. There's the gospel, people. That's the gospel. Jesus reconciling sinful men and women, boys and girls, to daddy, father, God. Jesus only can reconcile you to the father. No good deed, no religion, no other theology will, will reconcile you to God the father. The person and the personal relationship of Jesus Christ is your reconciliation to the father. He is the key in the door to heaven. He is the way, no other way. Don't be taken in by what the world will tell you today. It is a pack of lies. You have to know what the truth is, and we as believers in Christ need to be able to stand for that truth. Christ and Christ alone is our entry to heaven. Christ and Christ alone has reconciled sinner me and sinner you to the Father. Period, the end. So she says, my father, Jesus says, my father, my God, the gospel, I have reconciled you to the father. Your breach has been reconciled. Oh, my God. Let the Lord, let those words sink into every one of our hearts. The breach between us, sinners that we are, and a holy God was reconciled through the work done on the cross. I want to say something. Even as I'm saying that, do you know, that relieves you of a heavy burden. Yes, How many of us were raised with the words, you have to do this and God will love you. You don't do that. Oh, God's angry at you. You didn't do this. You didn't perform this. That is not the truth of the gospel. Those people may have meant well, but it is not the truth. We want to be people who walk in the truth of the word of God. The greatest news ever told, look at the last line on that. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. The greatest announcement ever given on this planet was the announcement that came through that precious woman. And he had said these things to her, and of course she shared with them. Let's look at our next one. So the early disciples all went to their deaths proclaiming those two truths, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and on the third day he rose again. They went to their martyrs' deaths proclaiming those truths. Today, 
In our world, we are seeing people going to their deaths proclaiming those truths. So we can see what's really rising up in the world that we live in, a real antichrist spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who is greater than any spirit, is making his people ready for events and times that are coming down the road. Amen? And we need to be prepared. How are you prepared? You get the word of God in your heart. It's not about uh, get collecting water bottles in the house. It's about getting your heart ready before the Lord. Next one. So we saw as we studied 1 John that Jesus, we know that the Son of God, John tells us about Jesus, has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him that intimate knowledge with him, that intimate relationship with him, just like Mary Magdalene had, that we may know him who is true. Jesus himself says, many are going to come in the end days and say, I'm the Christ, I'm this, I'm that. We have to know the one who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Remember, we talked about last week, what is faith? And faith is living as if God is actually telling the truth, right. and I can believe what he says. That's our true faith. Do we believe the Son of God alone has made restitution for my sin? Do I stay faithful to him alone, no matter what the world or the culture or the society I'm living in is telling me? We are not to be drawn in and swept away by the culture and the tradition of man. We ought to be drawn in through the truth of the living word of God. That's why you and I need to be reading that word and getting it into our heart. Remember a couple of weeks back, I challenged the church 10 minutes a day. That's all. 10 minutes a day you take in your Bible and sit with the Lord and let God download what he wants to say to you for the day. You have to hear the testimonies we're getting coming out of that. It's amazing. And that's what the Lord said. You know, we think I have to do this big whole deal. No, you don't. You just need to spend intimate one-on-one -on -one time with him, unplug from the rest of the world and say, Lord, you have my undivided attention. Let's look at our next one. Second Peter reminds us, for we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. The greatest testimony in a court of law is an eyewitness. The resurrection is the stamp and seal of the authenticity of the word of God. The resurrection tells us that God's word is true. It is God proving to us that his word is true, and we can believe it. Jesus tells us in our next one, John 18, 37, therefore Pilate says to Jesus, so you are a king? And Jesus answered him. He said, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Outside of Christ, there is no truth. In Christ, we gain the truth. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And he says to them, I am the way, the way, the truth, the life, not one of many other gods. You know that little bumper sticker that says coexist? Yes. Forget it. There's no such animal. Let's look at our next one. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, Martha, this was when Lazarus had died, I am myself the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trusts in, and relies on me, although he or she may die, yet they will live. And whoever continues to live and believe in, has faith in, cleaves to, and relies on me, that's an intimate relationship, shall never actually die at all. He's speaking of eternal life. We're all going to die to this flesh. It will be cast off, every one of us. But what he's saying here is, where are you going after that? Everyone's going to live forever. 
two places, heaven or hell. The choice is yours. God does not make that choice for you. You make that choice. Whoever continues in, Jesus says, to live and believes on me shall never actually die at all. That's the eternal death he's speaking of. Do you believe this, he says to Martha. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed and I do believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah. You are the anointed one. Yes. You are the son of God. Even he who was to come into the world and it is for your coming that the world has waited. And that is the truth. The world is waiting for the return of the Son of God, and he is coming back. These are declarations that the Son of God is declaring to be true. When Jesus speaks of himself, you can take it to the bank. He, we, he's declaring these things are true about me and this was my mission on earth the mission on the earth was what to reconcile us let's look at our next powerpoint so what was jesus mission to reconcile sinful man to a holy god john 20 17 but go, Jesus said to Mary, go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. That is Christ literally giving the gospel to Mary Magdalene. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, it was finished. What was finished? People trying to earn their way back to God. There is no deed on this earth you could ever do that would earn you back your way to God. Why? Because we are sinners by our makeup. Yes. And he is a holy God. The word of God says that we are literally conceived in sin. Humankind is sinful. That is our makeup. It happened back in the garden and it continues to this day. So we can't earn our way into heaven. Even though we might have been told that, it is not the truth. Jesus has made the way for us open into heaven. That's why we do not need to fear death. Because what the death that Jesus is referring to here is everlasting. It's eternal death. And when we have known Christ, we have stepped literally into eternity, and we will now live with him forever, even when we shed these bodies and we die. So his mission was to make that way ready for each and every one of us. With this one statement, Jesus let it be known that everything... Everything between God and man had changed because of the cross. That's why there's such a battle over Christ and over the cross. That's not for naught. The enemy knows exactly who Jesus is. He knows exactly what he has done. And he looks to prevent people from receiving Christ and from walking in his ways. That, that's his MO for all of us. But now a new relationship with God was available to all who would call upon the name of Jesus Christ. You know, in essence, what Jesus did is literally say, you're no longer orphans. Amen. You have been adopted now into the kingdom of the Father. You are not alone. Anyone sitting here who thinks, I'm so alone, maybe my family has deserted me, maybe I'm going through a real hard time, Maybe God has deserted me too. People might desert you. Christ will never desert you. That's what he came for. He came to literally reconcile you to the Father, which means to make you a friend of God. When the Father looks at any one of us, he sees the blood of Christ over us. When he sees that blood, he knows that person is redeemed. In other words, they have been bought back from the block, the slave block that we were all on, that the enemy had every legal right to hold against us. Yes. Every legal right. We couldn't say, oh, I didn't, or oh, I couldn't, or my husband made me, or I did. No, no. Because of our sinful self, the enemy had 
every legal right against you and I just to take us off captive. But the spotless son of God, the one who left heaven and came to the earth specifically for that mission. He didn't come for pomp and glory. He came because we were doomed and we had no other way out of our sin. And he said, I will go. I will be the remedy for their sin. I will be the antidote for their sin. I will be the one who rescues and captures them and takes them out of that pit that they have all been stuck in. I don't care how good you think you were, you were in a pit. That's right. I was in a pit. And even when I didn't know it, I had no way out. And God in his mercy looked and said, she has no way out of that unless I go and I go into that pit, become like her and rescue her out of that pit by my spotless death on the cross. No other remedy for sin. Going to church is great. It's not gaining you heaven. Being a nice person is sweet. It's not gaining you heaven. Christ and your relationship with Christ is the most vital thing you have in your life. We talked about in 1 John, faith. Your faith in Christ is what the enemy will wrestle you for every single day. Yes. Because he wants you to give it up. He wants you to say, life's too hard. I've prayed too long. How many times we hear people in their heartache and their heartbreak when something has happened, and they say, you know what, Carol, I prayed on this, I fasted on this, I believe God was going to come through on this, and the whole thing boomeranged, worked out the other way, the person got sick and died, the person left in divorce, my kid is on drugs, but we don't have the end results. We are called to trust in our God no matter what, because we trust in his character, that he is the same today as he was yesterday and will be forever. He's not going to fail you. This Christ that we are speaking of who rose from the dead is not going to fail you. Maybe your life is not going to turn out the way you wanted. Maybe the prayers are not, have not been answered the way you have prayed, but God is still good and he still has a future and a hope for you. And that's what the enemy is wrestling you for. He wants you to give up your faith in Christ, throw in the towel and say, it's just not worth it. And let me tell you, in the day and times we live in church, many are doing it. Many are doing it. I just don't believe anymore. What has happened to your faith? It became eroded. There was a lack of the word, maybe a lack of fellowship or even a lack of accountability. And they gave up their, their stand in the Lord. You have a place in Christ and in the body of Christ. No one else can fill. That's right. And there is an enemy who is muscling against you day in and day out. So you step out of your position. You say, I can't do this anymore. I've been let down. You know what? I've been let down by so many people in my life. And now, God, I'm let down by you. Because you're basing your faith on feelings, not on the facts of the word of God. If I had based my faith on the feelings of a situation I went through many times in my life, but going back to a situation where the man that I loved walked out the door and said, I don't want to be married anymore. If I have based my life on what I felt then and given up on Christ, we would not be having this conversation. Little could I know, little I couldn't even see what Christ had in store for me coming out of that situation. Were the prayers answered the way I wanted them to be? No. Was I discouraged and despondent? Yes. Yes. 
But the one thing I did was take my Bible and read my Bible. And I would literally go to bed at night clutching my Bible. That was the shape that I was in. And all I could say was, Jesus, help me. Help me. And guess what? He did. And you're seeing the product 30 some years later. That's what Christ does in us. But we are not to be foolish to the schemes of the enemy, church. Whatever you are going through, you need to know God is on your side. He is your champion. And he has a future for you, even if you, it's not the way you want it to be or the way you would like it to look. Every one of us, I'm sure, could give testimony to the dreams you've had to lay down and let God give you his dream. Let God give you his purpose. Let God give you his decision for your life. That's what God wants to do. But we are not to be foolish to the enemy who wrestles against us. And I want to encourage this body, precious body of believers, throw your vote in with the Lord. When the worst of days is upon you and you can't see light at all, throw your vote in with the Lord. That you know what, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't even know how I'll ever come through this, but I'm going to believe on you. And I'm going to put my faith in you because you are a good God, a good father, a loving father who will help me every day of my life. Yes. That's what God wants from us. That was the intimacy of Mary Magdalene with Jesus Christ. What she saw, what she was exposed to, the trauma and horror of that moment, only God could know. But she never gave up on the Lord. Don't give up on the Lord. Let's look at number 15. The resurrection provides the substance of the church's witness to the, to the world. That's why there's a battle for it. The substance of the church's witness to the world is on the resurrection. We do not merely tell lessons from the life of a prophet or a teacher. We proclaim the reality of the resurrection of the one Christ who was dead but is now alive. Jesus is alive. Yes. The resurrection assures us that Christ is alive and ruling his kingdom. That he's not just a prophet, a teacher, or a legend that lived years ago but that he will return again to the earth as the king of kings and lord of lords. When he returns, nobody's going to wonder, gee, I wonder who that is breaking through the clouds of the sky. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to say, he alone, alone is the most high God. No scratching of the head, no wondering. No one's going to elbow the person next and say, who do you think that is? Everyone's going to know who he is. Everyone. And church, he is coming again. Yes. How do we know he's coming again? He was resurrected from the dead. That is our proof of our God being alive and telling the truth. Now, we are going to have an awesome event right now. We're going to take communion. And as a body, we are taking communion because we too are testifying that, Lord, you are who you say you are. You are God. You are the Son of God. You were dead, but you are now alive forevermore. And I can trust you. And one day, I'm going to see you part those clouds. And do you know what? I'm going to be ready. Jesus. We don't have to fear Jesus coming back again, because by his spirit, he's making you and I ready. Amen? Amen. Part of us being ready 
is going to be our own communion service, where literally that body and blood of Christ strengthens us in Christ, in who Christ is in us, and makes us strong in everyday world that we have to face in, in every situation that we are confronted in.